in session. Here's Glenn with Yesterday's History for Today's Learners. Welcome, Glenn. Good morning. It is awesome to be able to connect with everyone today. Uh, last year, I had the chance to uh, spend a few days in the Rapid City Sturgis area doing some training and uh, was able to squeeze in an afternoon visit to Mount Rushmore. And, and for a history nerd, that's like going to Gettysburg or the Library of Congress or the National I Archives. It was like, you know, part of the required uh, history nerd bucket list. So when Julie contacted me about the same time to uh, spend some time chatting about primary sources, I took that as a good sign. So thanks for having me. I appreciate it. Um, thanks, uh, Peggy and Keith, too, by the way, for an awesome uh, presentation about using primary sources from the Library of Congress. I, I obviously want to piggyback a little bit on what um, Peggy and Keith talked about and share some of the hows and whys of, of using primary sources. I obviously want to include as much time as possible at the end and, and during the session for questions and answers as well. So um, I want to just jump into this and start talking with about the, the 50 minutes that we have. I want to give you as much information and, and uh, resources as possible. I don't know if you guys have been playing this particular game, but it's one of my um, it's one of my guilty pleasures, I guess. I've always been a trivia fan, and this particular game I got hooked on a couple uh, months ago. It's a mobile tool, and um, uh, don't if you haven't started playing it, don't play it. Stay far, far away. It's very addictive. Um, I'm just saying, don't start playing it. But uh, the more I play it, the more I start to realize that um, past social studies standards and assessments are have really encouraged us as social studies to teach in a way that, that creates really great trivia crack players, um, but not very effective citizens. We create really good um, students that are awesome at answering multiple choice questions about random facts without any sort of context. And as you think back to your own time as a student, um, I'm, I'm pretty sure that we can remember a teacher like this, somebody who lectured all the time that just gave worksheets, questions at the end of the chapter, the occasional map, maybe um, a chapter test on Friday. And, and I have to admit, um, I used to be that guy. I used to teach like this because I really didn't know much better. That's the way I was taught. That's the way I thought good instruction in the social studies looked like. But we know that this type of instruction really isn't that good for kids. There's, there's a lot of research out there that says, um, that we need to be doing history differently. And if you're not familiar with this particular guy, um, James Lowen, um, he wrote a book. One of his latest book is there on the screen for you guys to take a look at, teaching what really happened. But one of his first books uh, was called Lies My Teacher Told Me, Everything Your American History Textbook Got Wrong. And in that particular book, he talked about a couple things. Um, and, and one of those, I actually had a chance to just sit down and chat with him uh, a few years ago, and this is his quote that you see on the screen, kids don't hate history, they hate the way we teach it. Um, and we had some really good conversation about that, and I, I'd have to agree with that. Um, he asked, he did a, a, a really big survey with high school kids, and he asked them, what's your least favorite class? And the least favorite class was U.S. history. And... Um, that, I mean, we're below math. There, there's something wrong with that. Um, we shouldn't be at the bottom of, of uh, that particular list. And when you think about it, when you think about that same group of kids who said U.S. history is our, fav our least favorite subject, think about what they're doing once they leave high school. And, and as, we, as we all get older and as those kids get older, these are the kinds of things they're spending their time and money on. These are some of the, the best-selling books over the last few years. And if you take a look at those, by the way, the, the first one is one my wife uh, just finished. And um, she would have been the poster child for the kind of kid who said, U.S. history, world history, social studies is my least favorite subject. And um, if you take a look at that particular list, everything on there is history related, social studies related, there's contextual kinds of things that are going on there, themes and big ideas that um, are all about the social studies. When we look at the movies that people go to, um, these are not movies that do poorly at the, at the theaters. These are things that people want to spend time and money on uh, watching and interacting with and they all have to do with history and social studies. So, 
when James Lowen says um, kids don't hate history, they hate the way they teach it, I, I have to agree with them. I, I think some of the times when uh, we look at kids who really struggle or, or who aren't engaged in the content um, in our classrooms, it's not because they hate the content. It's not that, that they hate what um, the facts and figures are. It's just how we present it and how we ask them to, to interact with it. And I think uh, No Child Left Behind, for example, in a lot of state standards, especially in Kansas, where, where a lot of the teachers that I work with obviously teach, um, we've encouraged multiple choice sorts of assessments. We've encouraged the kind of instruction that that create really that create kids who are really good at, at the trivia crack world series, but that aren't uh, able to um, think historically to solve problems to use evidence like like Peggy and Keith were showing us earlier. And so, what I want to do is just give you a chance to to get a sense of what this might look like. What what is the what does a classroom look like that uses primary sources? And I know there's lots of teachers out there listening. Um, that are really good at doing this. And I, I hope this, what I'm going to talk about today and share with you today is not a review, but a chance for you to learn something new and adapt what, I, what I'm going to talk about and, and integrate that into your own classroom. Um, what does it look like? This is a guy um, that if you haven't read his stuff, you really need to find out more about this guy named Sam Weinberg. Sam Weinberg is now at the university or Stanford University at, at a place called the History uh, Stanford History Education Group. Um, and on the the link that Jane posted a few minutes ago, there's a, a lot of the stuff that I'm going to reference, or all of the stuff that I'm going to reference is on that page. And he has a there's a link there to some of his stuff. This is his book, and he, and if you can read the fine print, historical thinking and other unnatural acts. Basically, in this book, Sam Weinberg talks about how we sometimes assume kids know how to think, how to solve problems using evidence, how to analyze a political cartoon like we were doing earlier, uh, but they don't. And we need to train them how to do that, how to use evidence, including primary sources, to help them make sense of all of this stuff that we're going to throw at them. So what does it look like in the classroom? I'm going to suggest a couple of things. First of all, that we need to give them really good problems to solve. Nobody wants to ask a good question if there's not an intriguing problem or something that, that they want to figure out. Um, and once we give them a good problem or an intriguing problem, we have to give them evidence to analyze. And obviously, this is where the primary sources come in. And I want to make sure that teachers are really clear, and I want to make sure that we're all clear about why. what are, what are some of the skills that primary sources are going to help us um, encourage in our students. Um, primary sources are going to help us um, talk about bias and perspective to help kids think about comparing and contrasting um, connections and relationships between people and place and events. Um, some of the most important things I think we do when we train kids to use primary sources is exactly what, what, what Peggy and Keith were talking about earlier. We're, we're training them to make inferences based on evidence. We're training them to draw conclusions. And one of the one of the uh, my favorite reasons why primary sources are really good for kids is a teacher told me uh, this is a phrase she came up with: uh, assigning value. I love that um, assigning value. We're trying to figure out what's important and what's not important, who to vote for and who not to vote for. Why do I want to do this and not that? We assign value to evidence and. Um, I think these are the kinds of skills that we need to train our kids to do. So one of the things that we're doing in Kansas here at ESDAC, we're an educational service center based in the central part of the state. And what we're trying to do is to have, um, just like um, the, the model of inquiry that Peggy shared earlier, we're trying to create this uh, some sort of structure that can help teachers plan lessons in units. And this is what we've came, that this is what we've come up with. We call it the C4 framework. And you can see there there's four C's, collect, collaborate, create, and communicate. And with the amount of time that we have today, I really want to just focus on, especially just the first one, and maybe if we have time, the second one as well, of collecting evidence and making sense of that evidence. Um, this is the kind of thing that we want kids to be able to do. This is the process that every lesson and unit that we work with teachers in, in, in the state of Kansas uh, should we encourage to go through, create a problem, have kids collect that evidence, let them collaborate together to solve the problem, 
create a solution to the problem and communicate that solution out to everybody else. So this is what we're going to do today is to try to go through at least the first C, if not the first and the second C of collect and collaborate. And so I'm going to give you a problem. Um, you, need a, you need a buddy. You're going to need a partner to do this. So hopefully there's somebody close beside you um, that you can, you can uh, work with to solve a problem. Here's what I'm going to do is I'm going to show you two photographs, two images. Um, and your task is very simple. And I'm going to have to click back and forth a little bit. Or you can go to the link that I posted or, or that Jane posted earlier. And on that link that, that is in the chat window a little further up, and maybe I can just post it really quick too if I can do it. Um, there's the link. If you go to that link and have access to another tab or a window in your browser, um, it's going to be two photographs, photo one and photo two, in bold and red. This is the, this is hopefully, I'm going to go back, hang on. There we go. This is the first photograph. And I'm going to flip back and forth. Your task with your buddy is to solve this very simple problem. Why are they different? Why is this photograph different than that one? And again, I'm going to flip back and forth. Um, talk with your buddy. Um, why is this photograph different than this one? And Julie and Jane are going to kind of monitor, and I'm going to monitor as well, um, if you have problems viewing uh, these photographs or if you want me to switch back and forth between the two of them. So this is the first one, the first one I'm going to show you. Uh, again, like Keith said, this is a, a much longer uh, presentation. We're going to try to squeeze it into 50 minutes. So we're going to actually speed this process up a little bit. Um, you should be already, just like um, in the earlier political cartoon exercise, you're looking for details. We want to train kids to find those contextual clues and start to make sense of the data. And so one of the first questions you should be asking yourself, if you haven't already, is are they the same place? We want to train our kids to look for details. So if I click back and forth, you'll notice that there are some similarities in, this, in the roads of the, the, of the photograph, or the lines that are on the photograph. So I'm going to give you this bit of information. And, and again, normally this would take a much longer period of time. This is the same place. These photographs were taken of the same location. Now here's the other question that I hope that you're, that you're messing with is, when was the photographs taken? Another way to ask this is, which one was taken first? So I need some people to um, make a suggestion. So uh, Julie was asking different time periods. Yes, these are two different time periods. You guys need to decide and, and, and type in the chat box which one you think was taken first. And I, I obviously have them in a particular order. It doesn't mean that's the correct answer. So. Um, there's, I guess I'm going to call this the darker one and this one the lighter one. So we're going to use the term darker and lighter. Which one was taken first? And I don't know, Julie, are there actual people in the room with you? There's like a, a group or is this people all over the place? All right. I'm, again, with the amount of the way that we're interacting with each other via chat, it's a, it's not quite as much fun uh, because usually when we do this, there's a lot of arguing about which one uh, is the one that was taken first. I'm gonna I'm gonna tell you the answer because we're gonna move on to some other stuff. The the darker one was taken first, and here's what I want you to do. So this one was taken first. This one was taken second. So now that you have some idea, it was the same place. This one was taken first. The lighter one was taken second. So those of you who guessed darker, yes, high fives around for everybody. You guys are awesome. The rest of you, um, you're almost awesome. Um, now the question is really quickly, and, and again, we don't have a lot of time, but and you can't really see it unless you've zoomed in on the link that I gave you on the website. Um, why are they different? I'm going to tell you the answer at the end of our presentation. But this is the kind of problem that I want kids to mess with. Uh, I want to give them, a, a, this is a really a hook activity to a much longer uh, lesson and unit that I would be, that I could be teaching in either U.S. or world history. 
And so, you know, look at in the chat, um, hurricane, bomb drop, sort of disaster, exactly. Those are the kinds of questions and those are the kinds of um, things that I want kids to mess with. One of the teachers that I've worked with actually uses the term academic discomfort. I love that term, academic discomfort. Um, we're not sure what the answer is. And if I would show this, by the way, with to kids in my classroom, I'm obviously not going to tell them the answer either until tomorrow. I don't want first hour getting the answer and then going to second hour and telling them what the answer is. And so um, we want to create that academic discomfort in the brains of our students. Um, one person said it's an, an itch that has to be scratched. Uh, we want them to start to try to figure out the answer um, and that leads to better questions. So we're going to come back to this particular set of photographs later. Um, I'm not going to even give you, normally we'd start talking about dates and other kinds of evidence that we can pull in to help us answer the question. So it, it literally is, I, I, will, I will tell you this, and you guys can maybe between now and the end of the session go out and try to Google it, I suppose. Um, I will tell you the difference. There's a, a 10 year difference between the dark image and the light image. So this one was taken first, this one was taken 10 years later. So we'll come back to that one. Think about Think about that for just a little bit. Um, again, there's some really great guesses uh, going on in the chat room so far. Uh, unfortunately, none of you are correct. But we'll come back to it. Maybe spend some time Googling. We're going to come back and tell you the answer and talk a little bit more about it later in the presentation. Here's some other things I want to talk about before we move into this. This is a, this is a guy named Bruce Lesh. Bruce Lesh used to be a high school teacher in Maryland. He is now the Maryland Department of Education Social Studies Consultant. And he wrote this book, and I think it was Peggy, I'm not sure if it was Peggy or Keith, but one of the, one of the I think in the chat, or Peggy talked about, well, kids just want it, they just want the answer. They just want the easy answer. Just tell us the answer. And his kids were the same way, and actually that's what he titled his book. Why won't you just tell us the answer? In his book, he talks about using this idea of history labs, of giving kids problems to solve, and then providing evidence for them to mess with. And, and he, he describes this idea of history labs in this particular book. So if, if any of your departments are looking for some PLC kinds of things that they need to do, what is a book that we can talk about? Um, this is an awesome book, especially middle school and high school. Um, Bruce Lesh uses a phrase that I really like as well called text, context, and subtext. When we ask kids to look at evidence, uh, especially primary sources, text, context, and subtext. Text describes that stuff that's obvious. If you go back to the example that Peggy was using early, the political cartoon, the date when it was created, um, the um, magazine in which it was published, the political cartoonist who created it, the intended audience, those are things that are obvious. Um, just like she, she was talking about, those three stages, observe, that, that's what text is. We're asking kids to observe the text in quotation marks right here. What, is the, what are the clues? What are the things that are really obvious? The second thing that Bruce talks about is context. What was going on at the time? Now, in the political cartoon example that Peggy was talking about, context is the late 1800s, um, uh, Philippine um, war was going on. We were at war in the Philippines, Spanish-American War, imperialism, uh, colonization of, of these countries, Cuba and Puerto Rico and all these places in the Caribbean and, South, and Central America. That's the context. And we want kids to start to look at that as well. And he also talks about something called that he calls subtext, subterranean subtext, stuff that's underneath what's obvious. And he has this on his bulletin board uh, all over his room, text, context, and subtext. So when he says, hey, here's some photographs, here's some images, try to figure out this problem, they already know that this is a process they can go through, text, context, and subtext. And so uh, this particular resource from Bruce Lesh is a really good one, and I like his idea of training kids, just like Peggy was talking about this process of the, the primary source document analysis worksheets from um, the Library of Congress, give, give you and your students the ability to go through that process of observe and question and inquiry and all the things that, that we want kids to do. I just like Bruce Lesh's sort of um, a literary kind of thing of uh, text, context, and subtext. It's easy for kids to mess with. So um, 
I definitely would, again, recommend, just like Keith shared, the Library of Congress primary source analysis worksheets that they have. The one that you see on the screen is actually another one from the National Archives. And if you go to the website that I posted earlier and that Jane posted the link, there's uh, two or three links at the top of that page that share different types of primary source analysis worksheets. Um, and, and these are incredibly important, especially for elementary, upper elementary, middle school kids, because we have not trained them to think historically. Sam Weinberg says it's an unnatural act. It's not something that we're good at. And so we really need to spend some time training our kids to ask the right sorts of questions and, and practice the right sort of observational skills that, that Peggy was talking about um, earlier. And these primary source document analysis worksheets really give kids that sort of structure that they need to make sense of evidence. There's another link I would encourage you to go to um, that's on my page that I linked to earlier and I think I titled it Eight Tasty Graphic Organizers for Primary Source Analysis or something like that. Um, there's some other kinds of tools available. Um, obviously I always start with Library of Congress, the National Archives, but there's other sorts of graphic organizers out there as well and it really works for um, different types of resources, artifacts, maps, charts, graphs that we typically maybe don't think about. So be sure to check those things out as well. So when we start thinking about how we should do primary sources, um, this, is, this is the non-negotiable in my book. You've got to have these sorts of graphic organizers, these sorts of tools to give kids uh, a structure, a place to start because they don't know how to do this. So definitely take advantage of what the Library of Congress um, has published and made available, what the National Archives has published and made available as well. This is, this is another really handy tool for helping kids make sense of evidence um, in analyzing evidence. The Library of Congress, uh, oh, I don't know if I put that link on there. Um, maybe Jane can find it or Peggy might be able to know where it is. I can put it up later for sure. Um, we were working with some elementary teachers and I don't know how many elementary teachers we have in the audience today in the room today, but um, we were working with elementary teachers and they said, well, our kids can't do this. They can't think historically. They can't solve problems like what you're talking about. And um, I was kind of taken aback and I, I, I sort of understand their um, reluctant. This is high level sorts of thinking skills and and um, I was able to track down an article at the Library of Congress that documented how um, the Library of Congress staff was using primary sources with kindergarten kids. And one of the things I thought was really cool, they were doing a, a then and now sort of exercise with kids and the question, I can't remember the exact question, is what what is the what is the postal service, how do we get mail uh, how did people get mail and how do we get mail now? And they had a picture of a, of a U.S. Postal mail train car and they had taken this photograph and slipped it into a plastic uh, sleeve and they were having kids circle things like what, what do you think is going on in this photograph? What kind of activities are these people doing? And so they were circling with dry erase markers um, the activities, the things that were uh, that they saw in the photograph that they thought were important and then the teacher would discuss them and they would erase and start over and use different colors of dry erase markers for different things and I thought that was a really cool idea um, and we started thinking there's a guy and um, he teaches in a school in England um, Russell T uh, T Tarr T-A-R-R -R, and he developed that same idea I think separately and this is a photograph from his blog of using what he calls a sourcing overlay. And if you can't see it very well, I know the text is really small, but basically it's the same idea. We take um, a series of questions, primary source questions, text context and subtext. Um, and the questions, for example, from the Stanford History Education Group um, historical thinking chart put the questions around the outside of this piece of paper, cut out the middle and laminate it, and then train kids to slip the document. For example, this is a political cartoon. Slip that political cartoon under the laminated part of the paper, and then they have the questions on the outside. So yes, we as teachers can guide them in this analysis, but um, 
we can also start to train our kids to ask their own sorts of questions. So um, this is, I, I think, a really cool little resource that we need to take advantage of. I never thought about doing the lamination. I, you know, we can have the, the sleeve, but I like the fact that we can create separate sorts of um, political, or excuse me, um, primary source document analysis worksheets using the questions, for example, from the Library of Congress analysis worksheets. Put those questions on the outside, but leave that middle there for kids to mess with, mess with text. Uh, we can have kids um, talk about um, using red to, to text to source the document. We can have them use green to look at context, and we can have maybe blue to have them think about and highlight subtext, what's missing or what what is not obvious that we need to talk more about. So this is this is a really good sort of tool that I I, I think we need to take more advantage of. Um, actually some of the things that we're going to be doing in my office is to start to try to create some of these and share them out with different questions for different types of primary sources. So really quickly, um, I, I've, I've covered some stuff and I've talked now for about 20, 25 minutes. What I want you to do is very quickly, if you have somebody beside you, um, uh, turn to them and, and um, what, what, have, what have I talked about so far that really has caught your attention that I could actually use that in the classroom that makes sense to me? Or even this is something I already do and this is how I do it. So talk very quickly and we're going to take about a minute. So I'm going to be quiet for about a minute. Um, and, and don't just share it with your partner, but share it with us in the chat box as well. What, what do you like? What works? What have you already done that is similar? Yeah, Renee, I, I, that was a, a phrase I wasn't familiar with before, but I, I use it all the time now. And I can't even remember who shared that first with me. Uh, I just like the term academic discomfort. Our job is not to teach our kids. Our job is to make kids as uncomfortable as we possibly can. Um, that's really cool. Yeah, Deb, analysis worksheets for freshmen. One of the things that we're experiencing as you're talking, I'm going to talk a little bit as well. Um, uh, we're noticing a lot of middle school and high school kids, 7th, 8th, ninth, 10th graders, because in Kansas at least, because of No Child Left Behind, we have so many elementary teachers not being allowed or in, encouraged to teach social studies. They're coming to the middle school with, with very little background knowledge in, in social studies and obviously none of these historical thinking skills that we think are so important and, and using primary sources is um, one of the things they haven't had a chance to play with. So if we can use these kinds of tools to help them collect and organize evidence, I think that's just awesome. So um, thanks for the thanks for the um, the the chats. I'm going to keep going. I want to share a couple other things. And you're right. I the the sourcing overlay lamination thing. You can get by the way. Um, you don't even need like to make the questions. Maybe put the questions on another piece of paper. But the three ring binder kinds of plastic sleeves that you can get, those work really well as well to just slip in um, these sorts of things. So that that works really well. A couple other things I want to share with you. Um, I'm not going to talk very long at all, in fact very little, just so that you know what these are. There are lots of literacy activities that are available when we want kids to begin using evidence and primary sources and link those back to ELA kinds of things. In Kansas, this has really been a push for us um, of, of connecting um, ELA standards for history government with our own social studies standards and this is this is the kind of stuff that works really really well. Um, oh look, Keith found some clues, awesome. Um, okay, uh, we'll keep going. Darn you Keith, you're awesome. Um, 
these are literacy activities. I put links to all of these on that website that we shared earlier. These are just different tools. I like the history frame. It's just a great organizational tool for collecting evidence around a particular event. For example, word sorts is perfect for vocabulary, quick draw, and summarizing period pyramid or a fact pyramid, obviously perfect for um, summarizing book bits is a really good hook activity for um, introducing evidence, fiction and nonfiction especially. So be sure when you have time to go back and, and check out these different literacy activities. There are a couple other things that work really well. One is for, for messing with evidence and, and I'm focusing a lot on visual things today and um, I, I think sometimes we, we don't use images and photographs a lot. Um, this is something called graphic notes. Um, and this is the sort of, of, of photograph. Uh, I, I had the chance to see Selma about a month ago and just obviously uh, it's a, a very powerful and emotional movie about a, an important period of time. Um, if you don't recognize the photograph, John Lewis, a current congressman, is uh, in that white trench coat on the right. Uh, this is the first attempt to march from Selma to Montgomery. This is Bloody Sunday. and. Literally, uh, in about two minutes after this photograph was taken, you know, you know what happened. Everything just cut loose. Hopefully, you can hear me. Am I back? Okay, awesome. Thanks. Um, lines of dialogue. What would what would John Lewis be saying here? Uh, what would the the um, uh, law enforcement officers be thinking? Um, I always put myself in the in the mind of that guy right behind John Lewis. I incredibly brave and courageous sort of people. What was he thinking, and why was he there? So. Um, that's an, a, an incredible, powerful kind of thing. You can obviously do it with um, things that aren't photographs. Uh, these are all speech bubbles. They're no thought bubbles, but, um, you know, I'm really cold. Why are we doing this? That kind of thing. Putting kids in the, in the position of having them think about that particular event in different ways. Even world history teachers can use this as well. So um, thought bubbles and graphic notes are really good tools that we can use to help kids start to make sense of evidence and interact with the content that's embedded in the evidence. Um, and even, you know, graphic notes obviously work with visuals, but you can do similar sorts of things and writing prompts with text, writing prompts with the visuals. And on the website I share with you, um, that Jane shared with you, that we've been referencing back to, there's some links to, I think, I think I bolded them and put them in red. They're further down the page, but there's some really nice examples of writing prompts that we can um, use with kids as well. So this is a, a quick and easy way to, to have kids interact with content, so fast and easy. Here's another one that I really like. It's called a visual discrepant event inquiry. Okay, I'll say that one more time slowly. Visual discrepant event inquiry. The idea is that we want kids to, to use their questioning observation skills to find clues in an image and then answer questions about the particular image. So in this case, the where, when, and what. I need you to figure out, and this is another, this is a, a group activity, so you guys are going to have to find your buddy again. I'm going to, and again, we're going to go pretty quickly through this. Sorry, that's just the way it is. Um, I'm going to show you part of an image and then I'm going to reveal a little bit more and a little bit more and a little bit more and a little bit more. It's called the discrepant event inquiry. This is the visual form of it. There's also a, a, a textual version of this as well. Um, and it's been around a long time, this, this strategy. And as far as I can tell, it started in medical schools. It started in science classrooms of giving kids, um, students, science and, and future doctors, problems that didn't seem to make any sense and they had to diagnose and make sense of all this stuff. So um, a guy named Michael Yell, he's the past president of the National Council for the Social Studies, began to figure out, well, we could use this in social studies as well. We can give kids um, textual sorts of problems that they have to figure out using clues. This is a great way to train kids to ask great questions. Um, one example for the text, we're going to come back to the photo in just a second, but a textual version would be this sort of problem. 
The only reason we found this person is because this person was so hard to find. Now think about that for just a second. The only reason we found this person was because this person was so hard to find. It's discrepant. It doesn't seem to make sense. It's inconsistent. And so we, we want to do the same thing with photographs or images. And so your task, where, when, and what, based on this image, where was the photograph taken, when was it taken, and what is happening in the photograph. And we're going to go through this pretty quickly. So with your buddy, oh, where's Waldo? Nice. Yes, this is sort of like where's Waldo. Um, Four Corners is another example of the same sorts of things. I like different groups, but um, here's what you're doing. Your job in your in your chat box, um, put guesses for the where, when, and what. Where is this photograph taken? When was it taken? And what's happening in the photograph? And again, we're going to go through this pretty quickly. So you got about 30 seconds of an image. So don't mess around. We got to get going. Long ago, yeah, black and white. So we can start thinking about date, when, um, a very specific date. Yes. Why an old bar? This is the better question. We want them to guess, but they have to prove it. So Deb, why an old bar or a restaurant? What makes you think that? It's not just making a guess, but proving your guess with some evidence. I'm, I'm picking on Deb because she, she guessed old bar, and I guess the word bar kind of resonated with me for some reason this morning at 10 o'clock. Cash register. Okay, here's some more. So the cash register, yeah, definitely an old cash register. Um, he's wearing a jacket. I would agree. One person, by the way, earlier, uh, a couple months ago, I used this photograph. They, they thought this was Eleanor Roosevelt before I revealed everything. Um, it, it's not Eleanor Roosevelt. Um, but there is one little slice of the photograph left. And, and it's that last little piece that obviously is going to reveal enough information so that you go, ah, oh, that's what you meant. No, I will be, oh, I can't, oh, I can't believe I got that wrong. Um, it's discrepant. It doesn't, it doesn't make any sense. But in this particular sort of exercise, we're training kids to observe. We're training kids to um, ask questions. We're training kids to make um, solve a problem using the evidence and then support their conclusions or solutions with the evidence that they found. Now, that doesn't necessarily mean that what their that their conclusions are correct. Um, it's gonna it's gonna just start to train them to do this correctly. This is another great hook activity, by the way, and this is another sort of a tool or a strategy I would never reveal the answer to if I was using this with kids. Again, if I if I give you that last little piece. Um, first hour, you're going to go out until second hour, and third hour, and fourth hour, and then it kind of defeats the purpose. And we also want the brain to mess with this, maybe even overnight. Um, we know the brain continues to work on solving problems when it doesn't even realize it's trying to solve problems. So I would not show this last little piece until tomorrow. And in fact, I would do it on purpose. I would say, oh, look, the bell's going to ring, or we got to go for lunch, or it's recess, or we just don't have time to finish. We'll get this, we'll pick this up tomorrow. And I wouldn't show the, the last little piece until the next day. And then I'd come back the next day and I'd ask you again, let's, do you want to change your answers? This is what you came up with yesterday in your small groups. Where, when, and what? Do you want to think about this some more? Do you want to talk about it some more before I reveal the answer? Because some of you are going to be right and some of you are going to be wrong. So you want them to, again, to reflect a little bit more and review their thinking. The idea of metacognition is huge here. So um, just so you know, any last guesses? Give me a, somebody type in an actual year. I've, I've seen the 50s. I've seen the Great Depression. Somebody give me an actual year. 35, 42, 57, 62. Nice. Um, definitely when I show this to kids, they go, they just say it's really old. And I used to ask them why, and they say because it's black and white. So yeah, you're all correct in terms of the fact that it's really old. Hey, I was, I was also, maybe just so you know, I was born in 1962, sorry. Um, a lot of gray hair uh, here in Kansas on my head. Um, here's the last little piece.
Yeah, Mary, sorry, we're old. 1942, we're not that old. 1942, this photograph was taken in Kent, Washington in February 1942. This, this man is the mayor of Kent, Washington. He's a barber, so um, it is a store. It wasn't a bar, a restaurant. It's a bar. He's a barber. He's the mayor, and he is, he is pumped that the Japanese Americans in his area and his town were shipped off to internment camps. We don't need them back. Um, so a great hook activity to help kids start to think about that particular period of time, but also as an activity to train them to think historically and to ask good questions. Um, there's another tool that I won't, I'm going to, I'll give you a link to and you can go and look at it. We're not going to have time to, to spend a lot of time on it. But the idea of, of taking now this evidence that we found and collaborate with that evidence in different ways. Um, this is a, if you have the access to technology, this is a tool. It's Padlet.com, and this is what it looks like. I'm going to show you a link in just a second um, that would take you to this particular page. And remember the photographs we showed earlier, uh, the, the two photographs, the dark and the light photographs. I want kids on, in a collaborative way, uh, a, an online sort of um, conversation room where they can post their ideas. And Padlet gives me that ability to do um, collaborative document document analysis. I can I can put out a prompt. Uh, here's the two photographs. You guys, this is your homework. Come back tomorrow or post the stuff at the at, at between now and tomorrow when you come back from class. They can post their their thinking. They can uh, upload documents, YouTube videos, URLs, links, all sorts of stuff. This is the link, sorry, um, that you can go to if you want to play around with Padlet.com. You can make a free account. You can upload as many, create as many Padlets as you want. Um, and uh, obviously, right now it's it's wide open. But realize that if you go to that website, that that I'm the link that I'm showing you, um, I can moderate it. I can password protect it. Anybody right now can post whatever they want. It's wide open. But I know better to do that than with middle school kids. Middle school kids are. I mean, they're evil by nature. I don't want to, I'm not going to let them just post whatever they want. So I'm going to control it. I'm going to moderate it. But this, this link takes you to a page that looks like this. And people can begin to post, kids and groups of kids. And I can respond and I can hand out homework through this. I can pass out documents through this digitally. And so it's a, a collaborative sort of tool that I want kids to start to mess with. Um, a couple more things real quick. we got about five minutes left. Um, if only there were other tools that we can use. And I want to highlight two real quick. Just This is like your walk away. This is your sort of exit card activity that you're going to spend time over the next week playing with a little bit. There's a tool that just came out and it's called Zoom In. And you can find it on that page that I, that I posted earlier. Zoom In is by default the it's a game changer. It comes out, they're gonna, it, you can access it now, create an account, but they're going to roll out officially in about a month or so. Basically, Zoom In gives kids the problems. This is all online, by the way. Give kids a problem, lets them um, get, have access to these documents. They have to analyze the documents, record their thinking. Off on the right-hand side, you can see the text boxes where their thinking goes. All of these notes, all of this thinking then is um, embedded automatically into a place where when they start the writing, uh, to solve the problem, to answer the question. All of their thinking from the document analysis is ready to be used. Copy and paste. Just click and drag and drop. Um, as the teacher, you can follow all of this stuff, and it's really, really awesome. So I'll let you play around with that when you have time. And the last thing I want you to be aware of is, is something I talked about the C4 framework earlier. Collect, collaborate, create, and communicate. And one of the things that we've done to support this idea is to create what we call C4 cards. So um, we create a whole different sets of cards. On the front is a strategy or an idea. And on the back is a, a, um, alignments to the Common Core standards, the ELA standards for history and government, and the College Career and Civic Life standards from the National Council for the Social Studies. So these cards and these sets of cards, we're just we're making it available, and they are out there. So two more little tools that you can use. Um, this is the website we've already been. Um, by the way, real quick before we leave, um, and maybe some quick questions. Um, the answer to the photographs earlier, why are they different? Here's the answer. Um, the first one, 1935, Warsaw, Poland. The second photograph, 1945, Warsaw, Poland. Um, 
Why were they different? Because in 1943, the Germans sent in SS troops and basically just demolished the entire Jewish ghetto in, in Warsaw. And if you can zoom in on the website, the two links, you'll see that there is nothing there. The German soldiers have destroyed the entire area. There is nothing left. And so the reason they are different is because in 1935, obviously, the buildings were still intact. And in 1945, two years later, after the ghetto uprising, the Germans had destroyed that entire ghetto. It's a really good activity um, to help kids again, start to think about observation skills, questioning skills, um, so problem solution skills, um, and it's a great hook activity in this case to uh, a unit on the Holocaust. So that's the answer. If you, if you guess that, um, I'm sure Julie and Jane will give you a free book of some kind, right? Julie or Jane, so there you go. See, you've got to right. get a book right. out of for some <laughs> Here's my contact information, just so you know, if you want to get a hold of me. I'm going to leave that up there, and if there are questions that, that Jane or Julie saw that I missed, um, um, I've got maybe, I've got like three minutes, so I'm, I'm, I'm open to some quick summary of something. You're good. Has a um, Scott is asking a Padlet. The, the difference in Google Classroom, I would definitely use Google Classroom. I really like Google Classroom, but Google... Um, Classroom and Padlet are different in the fact that Padlet is more of a visual kind of a tool um, that they can, everything is there in one place. And I know that Classroom has that sort of streaming uh, Facebook feel to it. I, I think together they work really well. Um, I'm not sure one is better than the other. If you have access to both, I would definitely use both. Great question. Okay, any other questions? Get them in now, please. We've got a couple minutes. Glenn, you've given us all kinds of great ideas and great resources. Yeah, I, I hope I didn't go too fast. Obviously, um, you can go back. The presentation is online, actually, with a few other things designed specifically for elementary uh, teachers. So if there's any, like, K-6 people in there, the link, the, the website has a, a presentation that's very similar to this with some additional stuff in it. Um, and some of the differences, obviously, or additions would be the elementary piece of using primary sources with elementary, so um, definitely check that out. Super, thanks so much. And Julie has posted the presentation and all the links there for you. And the recording will be posted also next week. We do have another question. I don't know if you'll be able to answer it. How did they get such good pictures of Warsaw in 1935, and how did they get the pictures from the same location? Uh, it's a great question. The photographs are actual aerial, aerial photographs. These are from Google Earth. There's a, there's a tool in Google Earth that you're going to have to explore, and I don't have a lot of time to explain it, and I apologize, called Historical Imagery. Um, Google Earth allows you to click a button called Historical Imagery, and you can go back in time in different places um, and take screenshots of those aerial photographs. So those photographs I set up, I, you know, I use the the slider in the historical imagery and I arranged it so that I had the, the same exact angle and position and height in Google Earth, took the screenshots and then used them um, to create those two photographs. Google yeah, Earth did not exist in 1935, but the, 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 the ability to take aerial photographs did. So what Google has done is to take some of those photographs and then put them um, in the, into their Google Earth. You'll notice um, I'm not sure who took the pictures, and, and Julie cut me off when I run out of time, but um, you'll notice that the first photograph, the darker one, actually has some things laid, actually pieces of paper laid over the train, uh, the rail car area, the, the, the places where the rail was and where the bridges for the river were. Um, it, was it was a classified photograph um, in 1940s during World War II, and that's why they covered up some of those pieces. Wow, that is great information. Wow. I know we'll all be spending a lot of time on your uh, resources that you provided for us and use some of these ideas in our teaching. Thank you so much, Glenn. Uh, as someone said, we could listen to you all day. Uh, but it's time to move on. So thanks so much for being with us. Our next speaker yeah, is getting set up. Appreciate it.
You bet. Uh, we'll take a short break and do a sound check with our next speaker, Dan Daly, and we will start up again at 11 o'clock Central, 10 Mountain Time, with uh, Dan Daly from the University of South Dakota. Thank you. And if you want to keep chatting in the